the devil made me do it, is a phrase that has been used over the years to justify everything from eating an extra helping of dessert to rationalizing a romantic dalliance to excusing heinous real-life crimes. But the true story behind the next Conjuring film is also the first time in American history that the devil made me do it was used as a murder defense in a court of law. In 1981, a man murdered his landlord. The case didn't get much notice, even after the man accused of the murder claimed he didn't do it. What caught the public's attention was the defendant's claim that the crime was actually committed by a demonic force that possessed him. Today on Scream to Scream, we're going to possess you with the true story that inspired the latest installment in the Conjuring film universe, The Conjuring, The Devil Made Me Do It. Before we do that, make sure you subscribe to Graveyard Shift and let us know in the comments which true life ghost stories you'd like us to cover in the future. On February 16, 1981, Arne Cheyenne Johnson stabbed his landlord, Alan Bono, multiple times in the chest with a five-inch pocket knife. Bono later died of his wounds at a hospital. At the time, Johnson was 19 years old and working as a tree surgeon. He had moved with his girlfriend Debbie Glatzel into a room next to the Brookfield Pet Motel, where Debbie worked as a groomer. The 40-year-old Bono, who owned both the Pet Motel and the room, had taken all three out to the Mug and Munch Cafe earlier in the day, where witnesses say they had been drinking heavily. Johnson was later found by police two miles away from the scene of the crime at a bar called Hackney's. It marked the first recorded homicide in the 193-year history of the small Connecticut town of around 13,000. The prosecutors claimed the motive for the crime was just a case of drinking gone bad. But if you ask Arn Cheyenne Johnson, his girlfriend Debbie, or amateur demonologists Ed and Lorraine Warren, Johnson was under the influence of far worse than alcohol. According to Johnson and Debbie Glatzel, the murder on that February night was first set in motion months before, when Debbie's younger brother David woke in the middle of the night screaming. David claimed he'd been visited by a man with big black eyes, a thin face with animal features, and jagged teeth, pointed ears, horns, and hooves. The terrifying entity told him, beware. If only the family had heeded those words sooner. We believe David, Debbie Glatzel said of her then 11-year-old brother, he didn't lie, and he never liked anything spooky, not even scary comic books. David continued to suffer nightmares of the figure that his family came to call the Beast, and it even began to appear before him during the day, taking the form of a little old man with burnt-looking skin and a plaid shirt torn at the elbow. The family heard odd noises from the attic, and David would wake up with unexplained scratches and bruises on his body. At night, someone had to sit up with him. He would kick, bite, spit, swear, terrible words, his mother later said. She also described invisible hands strangling him and powerful forces that would flop him rapidly head to toe like a rag doll. He gained 60 pounds in only a few months and quoted from the Bible and from Milton's Paradise Lost. In desperation, the Glatzel family contacted the local Catholic church and eventually Ed and Lorraine Warren noted paranormal investigators. Right away, I knew there was something to this, Ed Warren said in 1981. I felt like a good fisherman when he knows there's something on the line. Lorraine Warren claimed that while Ed interviewed the boy, she saw a black, misty form next to him and that David made repeated references to stabbings. She knew they were sitting on a powder keg, and in October, before Arn Cheyenne Johnson stabbed his landlord, the Warrens called the Brookfield Police Department to warn them that they were working with clergy in a home they thought to be a demonic lair and that there was a potential for some violent act. Based on their investigations, the Warrens concluded that no less than 43 demons were possessing young David Glatzel. Further, the couple claimed they were present for three lesser exorcisms, which were attended, they said, by members of the local Catholic Church. However, a spokesman for the Archdiocese maintained that a formal exorcism was neither requested nor performed. Whether actual rites of exorcism were performed or not, the Warrens and the Glatzels claim they witnessed Arne Cheyenne Johnson repeatedly demand that whatever demon was possessing young David should, quote, come into me, leave the little lad alone. Unfortunately, according to Johnson's defense attorneys and the Warrens, something took him up on the offer. In the following weeks, Johnson seemed to change. Debbie claimed he would go into a trance, growling and saying that he saw the beast. Later, he would have no memory of it, just like what had happened to her brother David. As Johnson's defense would later point out, he had never had any trouble with the law when he was younger. 
He had played Little League, sang in the church choir, and once used his earnings as a newspaper carrier to buy his mother an $80 car so she didn't have to walk to work. According to Johnson, the Warrens, and his lawyer, one of the demons that had been plaguing young David Glatzel had now entered the 19-year-old man and forced him to take the life of his landlord. The courts have dealt with the existence of God, said Martin Manella, Johnson's attorney. Now they're going to have to deal with the existence of the devil. He attempted to enter a plea of not guilty, asserting that his client was suffering from demonic possession at the moment of the crime. While Johnson's defense had plenty of what they considered evidence, including testimony from the Warrens and Debbie Glatzel, not to mention photographs and tape recordings made during David Glatzel's supposed demonic possession, what didn't help their case was the refusal of the Catholic Church to cooperate. While the archdiocese acknowledged that four priests had worked with the Glatzels to try to help David, none of them were allowed to speak publicly about what had happened there. And church representatives vehemently denied the claim that any rites of exorcism were ever performed. But Ed Warren claimed to have tapes showing that the priests had gone to the bishop to request an exorcism, and that if they didn't come forward, Johnson's defense would use Warren's tapes to prove it, and they'd subpoena the priests to testify. The prosecution, meanwhile, kept its case simple. The crime, they said, was not the result of a demon entering Johnson's body, but rather a large amount of alcohol. The second witness called by the prosecution was a waitress at the Mug and Munch Cafe, who testified that Johnson and Bono had spent about three hours in the establishment on the day of the slaying, drinking between 13 and 15 glasses of wine. The crime, the prosecution argued, was the result of a day spent drinking, which led to an altercation, which led in turn to Bono's violent demise. According to the EMT who arrived on the scene, Debbie Glatzel repeatedly said, quote, he didn't mean to do it, but you know how he gets when he's drinking. Johnson's defense attempted to enter a plea of not guilty by reason of demonic possession, but presiding judge Robert J. Callahan rejected the plea, ruling that such a defense would be impossible to prove and that any attempt to do so would be, in his words, irrelative and unscientific. Johnson's attorney then changed his plea to self-defense, but the jury, after 15 hours of deliberation over three days, found Johnson guilty of first-degree manslaughter. He was sentenced to serve 10 to 20 years in prison. In 1983, less than two years after Arne Johnson was convicted, Bantam Books published The Devil in Connecticut, a book written by Gerald Brittle, working with the Warrens. That same year, a TV movie called The Demon Murder Case premiered on NBC, also based on Johnson's crimes, albeit with the names and other details changed. Arne Johnson was 19 years old when he took the life of Alan Bono. He and Debbie Glatzel married in 1984 while Johnson was in prison. Ed and Lorraine Warren described the couple as very happy. Lorraine Warren told reporters, quote, he's coming home to live in a very good family atmosphere. The couple indeed stayed together, and in January 1986, after serving a little less than five years of his 10 to 20 year sentence, Johnson was released. The chief of parole described him as an exemplary inmate. The state parole board asserted that there were no negative factors in Arne Cheyenne Johnson's mental state when he was released from prison, but if he or the Warrens were to be believed, it wasn't really his mental state anyone had to worry about. Fortunately, the Warrens also declared that Johnson showed no signs of being possessed following his release. Possession doesn't last 24 hours a day, Ed Warren had said. Warren believed that Johnson now understood what had happened to him, and that if something happened again, he would be able to ward off the devil. My brother was never possessed. Carl Glatzel Jr., Debbie's other brother, who was 16 years old at the time of their younger brother David's supposed possession, had said of a lawsuit that he and his brother brought against the Warrens more than 20 years later. Carl claimed that he, along with his family, had been manipulated and exploited, not by demonic forces, but by the Warrens. The family received $2,000 from the book publisher at the time, but the suit, prompted by the book being brought back into publication in 2007, now called the contents of the book, The Devil in Connecticut, complete lies. Carl Glatzel Jr. asserted that his younger brother had suffered from mental illness, that his family had sought psychiatric help even while the Warrens were performing their investigations and that the Warrens had enticed their family with promises that they would be millionaires. He also claimed that the publicity surrounding the case had cost him friends, relationships, and business opportunities over the years, and that the Warrens had painted him as a villain in the book, simply, he says, because he had a sane voice and knew the story was false at the beginning. 
The Warrens, for their part, claimed that a satanic death curse was placed on both the Glatzel boys and that Carl Jr. was oppressed by demons and used as a pawn to instigate violence and arouse skepticism. The book's author, Gerald Brittle, claimed to have spent more than 100 hours interviewing the Glatzel family and that his book was based entirely on fact that just to be sure he got it right, the family had received the manuscript before it went to the printer, and that they had vouched for its accuracy and veracity. At the time of the lawsuit, Johnson and his wife, Debbie Glatzel, still contended that the demonic possession story was true and supported Ed and Lorraine Warren, claiming that Carl Jr. was simply suing to make money. So what do you think? Was Arne Cheyenne Johnson lying when he claimed, the devil made me do it? Was he truly possessed when he stabbed his landlord to death? Did Johnson take on a demon from tormented young David Glatzel? Was the Catholic Church hiding something, or was it all just a clever manipulation by the Warrens to garner fortune and fame? Let us know in the comments below if you have the courage. And don't forget, like, share, and subscribe for more videos from The Graveyard Shift.